Leaders. Real life leaders. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And I'm so excited. We have Matt Saunders with iBuy757.com. And he is absolutely amazing. One of my good friends, but he also has over 70 properties that are rental properties completely paid off. And he's making how much a month are you making on those properties every month, Matt? Well, the rent, I don't have the exact number, but it's over 70,000. Yeah. Um, so over $70,000 that's coming in in rent every single month. So you guys are in for a treat. We're going to find out all of the ins and outs. So let's first start by talking about someone who just wants to buy their very first rental property. What is kind of your best tips on kind of the questions they need to ask or what's their first step when they're deciding, okay, is this a good rental property for me or not? All right. That's really easy because I, I you know, did that years ago. And um, here's, here's what the first thing I'd say is completely forget whatever house you like. Cause I remember I had trouble. I'm like, I don't want to buy in that neighborhood. Um, okay. I could see possibly living in this neighborhood. I'll buy here throw that out the window. Totally. And the reason I say that is you're buying real estate, not because it's real estate, you're buying it because you want it to do something for you, which chances are is make money. So like you got to get rid of your preconceived notions of neighborhoods um, because you can see something as a really rough neighborhood but it rents just fine because there's plenty of people from really rougher neighborhoods that think it's a great neighborhood. So, so that's the first like predisposition to get rid of. And then the second thing to do is why do you want real estate? Like when I talk to people that are like, I thought it was a good idea. So I bought some rental property. Um, that is usually not a great place to be because you can't measure Am I happy with this? Does this work for me? In 10 years, will it work for me? Um, you want to be like, hey, this is exactly what I'm, my goal is over a five-year period, a 10-year, a 15-year period. Like when I first started buying houses, rentals, not houses, you know, um, I had no interest other than having that thing paid off in 15 years. I didn't need to make money in the middle. So I put 10% down, put it on a 15-year mortgage, and that was my goal was 15 years from now, it's paid off. I will have a bunch of them paid off. That'll be worth it. I make my money over here. These things pay themselves down and I get to a place I want to be financially. So the big thing I would say is figure out what you want to do number wise and also time frame wise, because had I bought them to just like, hey, it's a good idea. I'll buy some rental property. What would have happened is in the tough years, I definitely would have sold them because I'm, I would just have not had uh, something worth sticking through for. So um, if you don't determine what you want out of it, and I'm talking numbers, just like if you buy a stock or something, a mutual fund, you're not buying it because you want to buy one. You're buying it. Hey, I, I'm hoping it does this over this period of time. And that's what I, you know, I'm looking for. So, so start with that. If you start with that, you can evaluate properties and confidently, you know, confidently. So one thing that I'm hearing you say is, okay, ask yourself the question, am I buying this for cash flow so that I can have money coming in every month? Or am I buying it for appreciation or am I trying to buy it for both? And I think it is kind of hard to get both right now with the market being the way that it is. If it's, it's kind of like, okay, what's more important? Is it for cash flow? Is it for appreciation? What, what other questions would there be really? Right, right. I mean, you want to articulate numbers in that, in those scenarios. Um, when we first bought, our rental properties, the first few, it was 2003 or 2004. And literally they doubled in value by like 2007 or whatever it was, um, which is really 
unlikely. Yeah, I mean, he, I won't even go into why that happened, but anyhow, um, appreciation is a, is a solid game as long as you can stick in the long term. You're not going to really know. It, it's not, it's not going to be a straight line usually. Um, but if you can stick in the long term, the property will appreciate. And of course, the key is in that long term, you're not being financially drained by the house. Um, if it's breaking even, truly breaking even, not like you saying it, but when you do the math, you discover. And I guess that's what I'm trying to get to is most people don't do the math enough to decide, does this make sense? So you do the math enough to decide that and, um, and you'll be fine. So yeah, cash flow or appreciation, I agree. I first bought for a perceived cash flow I would have after they were paid off. You know, let's call it 10 years into it. I realized that that's not, um, I didn't really like that. Let's just put it that way because they were a little bit of a financial drain. Um, and then I started buying just for cash flow, which took place in what, you know, I'll call the hood, but that's not really a nice thing to say. I'm just talking about neighborhoods that are, let's just say, in the lowest 20% in your market area of prices, okay? We'll call that the hood. <laughs> and, and, and the reason for that is the discrepancy, like let's just say a place in the hood worth $100,000, rents at a thousand bucks. A place at, in another neighborhood worth 300,000, rents at like $1,400. So, so and, and those numbers aren't meant to be exact, but in general, you find that relationship as housing values go up, the percentage of rent, it gets smaller. And I, maybe it won't be that way moving forward, but um, that's what it's been in the past. So in the past, um, I stuck to the neighborhoods where we could buy like 50,000 all in, getting $1,000 a month in rent. Very hard to do today. That same house, a, a normal type person that wants to get involved would probably be for a hundred thousand. But you know, as you go to lower priced houses, the rents surprisingly don't keep dropping. Um, and I'm sometimes beside myself because I'm like, hey man, they're renting a house in this neighborhood for twelve hundred dollars for fourteen hundred. They could be in such a better neighborhood. But that's not how people think. They've got jobs, they have friends, they have people they know in an area and yeah. So I want you to talk about that a little bit more because so so one rule of thumb that is kind of the old school version that people used to do, and we call it the 1% rule where it says the 1% rule is like, if the rent, for example, is $2,000, then the purchase price should be 200,000. So it's the mm -hmm. potential investment. I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I mean, you know, it, it's, it, it really, I mean, I, I think I, when I first got started, I think that was kind of like my little thing I was thinking is like, Hey, if we can pay 120, if we can rent it for 1200. Um, so but tell I mean, me what you fine. were saying, explain um, your mo, mo, explain what you were saying for just a second. Cause you said $50,000 purchase uh, so, price so to so a $1,000 rent. Yeah, sure. So if I'm buying a place for $50,000 and I can get $1,000 a month rent, I consider that a good cash flow rental property because if you back out taxes and insurance, and let's just say you just say 300 bucks a month for all repair maintenance stuff, that's still $500 a month or 6,000 a year. I'm like, that's good. You know, well, that's, that's not everything. good. That's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, in the same, you know, whether it's a hundred thousand, you know, you, you're the challenge with the rental property is this, and it's kind of the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, but you got to talk about it. When you take PITI and then you slap on 300 extra dollars a month, for maintenance and repairs or whatever number you want to slap on. In my case, I slapped on a hundred when I was new and that was not how it was. That's a the rentals cost me money annually. Um, do the numbers work? 
that's really it, you know. And and if and it, and if your negative cash flow, meaning like when you put on three hundred dollars a month for repairs after PITI, um, you can just make that decision and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to be paying a little out of my pocket annually, but I think in a fifteen year period or a ten year period or even a five, but you know. The longer you go, the more correct you will be because the market's always correct. So they always, you know, fix themselves. Um, you can just make a conscious decision that, hey, you know, I might pay, you know, 2000 extra bucks a year for the first five years. And then probably rents will be high enough where I don't have to do that. I just don't want you as a new investor to buy a property and, have an unreal expectation that repairs are going to be really low because they will be really low. And then like on year four, you're like really spending a lot of money because the carpet, the paint, they mess up the countertops. You, you, you might get an $8,000 a year, you know? Um, but yeah, long-term perspective and just adding up the PITI and putting a number on it that you think needs to be there for, um, maintenance and repairs and knowing that the long game is how you make the money. That's really it. I mean, I started buying rental property in 2002, 20 years ago. So there you have it. Like if I had made a decision in 2010, I probably would have said, well, I got this equity, but I'm not making much money other than that. And this is a headache. So let me cash it in. Okay. So let me give you a scenario. Let's pretend that somebody bought a house for $200,000. Let's say the loan amount was $160,000. They put down $40,000. And now their principal and interest on that property is $800 a month. And then let's say they have another $100 for taxes and another $100 for insurance. So now we're basically at $1,000 a month. Okay. I'm tracking. Yep. And then let's say we then add $300 for repairs. And then we add on another $150 a month for vacancy. And then let's say we're doing, they're not managing the property themselves. So it's another $150 in management fee. And pretend that there's a property owners association that's $30 a month. And then let's say we have another. $30 in accounting and legal fees. Well, so, you, uh, do the math. I mean, I don't think you're going to be making money monthly when you figure those in. But what I do like about what you're saying is in, in the biggest problem that people have is they don't want to anticipate repairs and vacancies because the numbers don't work. And then I'd rather you anticipate that and say, ooh, we're losing on the average $200 a month when we consider repairs and vacancies, even though that's not going to occur monthly. It's going to occur like, you know, in, in, in a, you know, a month, 17, $5,000, you know, stuff like that. Um, I'd much rather see that and then them anticipate it than be the normal. They're like, hey, PITI is property, principal interest taxes and insurance. I don't want to confuse anyone is, you know, a thousand bucks a month. I'm running at 1200. I'm making 200 bucks a month. Um, that's what the typical person is going to go do is going to think like, and I'd much rather do exactly what you're saying, account for a certain amount, whether that's 300, you know, whether it's 150 for vacancy, those are numbers that really are dependent on the condition of the house when you buy it. Like if it was brand new, I put in like 50 bucks a month for repairs because it's just going to be little silly stuff for the first five years and maybe even 10. Um, but vacancies, like you talked about, that you as a potential landlord have a high degree of control over vacancies. Tenant selection is, is huge. Um, so, you know, if you select the right tenants, your maintenance is gonna be lower too. Um, your vacancy is gonna be lower. 
you know, you could, I would, I would encourage people if they could, could just do three year leases right there. I mean, you've cut your vacancy down, but it might not be realistic if someone buys a house and they're passing up people that are good tenants that will sign an annual and they're going three months to find someone that's a three-year lease. It just costs too much. But you, by tenant selection, you can affect your vacancy, your, your vacancy cost of making that note. So really long, I'm sorry for being long-winded. Sure, 300 plus 150, great. I'd rather you overestimate it than not estimate it. And I think when you really estimate it like you've gone through, it may be difficult to make the numbers work unless you're in that lowest 20% of the market. And I'm picking 20%. It could be 35%, whatever. You have to figure that out wherever you're buying. Well, on this property, let's pretend that I could do $1,500 for per month for rent. When I just read you all of those expenses, that came out to $1,700 a month. And I have a spreadsheet that goes over this where literally all you have to do is put the numbers in, which is really mm -hmm. awesome. So if you are looking for that, you can type it in the chat or you can email us at just email me to Chantel at Kanzel.com and I would be happy to send you that spreadsheet. But if you are looking for this particular property, let's say the monthly expenses are 1700, the monthly rental income is 1500. And then someone says, well, I'm at a loss of $200 per month. But in my mind, I'm buying this not for cash flow. I'm buying this for appreciation. And I know that in let's say I do you know, even a 15 year loan, I'm in my mind, I go, okay, in 15 years, this thing's going to be paid off and this will be money that's coming into my retirement. That's would what you, I did. Would you advise someone to, to do this deal or would you say? Oh, on the 200 a month negative, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be completely based on the individual because let's just say an individual has just enough to get that one property going, but if they're not, if they don't have enough income or financial reserves to maybe weather some, some unexpected stuff, that might not be a great decision. But if it's somebody who has, you know, a hundred grand in savings after it all, well, yeah, why not? I mean, you're going to be fine. You know, there, there's some personal financial management that you definitely want to think through when you're doing an investment that requires monthly payments to continue on, even if your tenant's not paying, there's a world of hurt out there with landlords that have notes after the um, rental relief program got kicked in um, because a lot of people weren't getting rents for a lot of time. Yeah. I mean like six months or more, but that's, that's COVID. Let's just put that whole, whatever you want to call it behind us. And um, that rental relief program is supposed to end in June. And the judges in the court systems locally are already back to being judges where before they were uh, quacks at best. I mean, literally the tenant doesn't show up and they just continue the case. They were working for the tenant that wasn't paying rent. Yeah. And didn't have COVID by the way and didn't lose their job because of COVID. That's like one out of 10 people that are on the rental relief program actually should be on it. You'll get me on a hot topic. <laughs> I'm just gonna back off that. Um, so that's a good point. But so let's go back to like someone saying, what's happening right now is that people are saying, okay, you've got this 1% rule where you say, okay, if I can get $2,000 a month for rent, buy it at 200,000. But realistically, you say there are no properties out there for me to buy. So that's, I can't, I've been looking, I haven't been able to, maybe they said, okay, I'll just wait until the market softens. And here we've just been increasing, 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 increasing. And so the person's kind of sitting on the sidelines, sitting on the sidelines and they go, man, I wish I would have gotten in the game, you know, 
three years ago because I would have had, you know, all of this appreciation. And I, I waited too long to have this perfect 1% rule. And now I wish I would have bought all those properties that didn't quite make it. So it's kind of like, what kind of advice would you give to someone like that? I, I guess I could best say by like what I did that verse. Okay. So I started buying rental property. I think it was September, 2002, the first time I bought one. And then by August, 2003, the values had gone up so much that the um, math for me to buy it, which was back then, I want to put 10% down. I want to put it on a 15 year mortgage and I want to have at least a hundred dollars spread between the rent and PITI. Um, when, when it got, when values got too high for that not to work, I said, okay, that's not working. And I'm not, I'm just going to save my money until I can find deals that work. And then um, let's say from 2004 to 2010, I might've gotten, I'm just going to say four or five properties. You know, I'm in the house buying business and I couldn't even buy houses that made sense for rental property. The flip, yeah, it could make sense, but not for rental property. You know, it was very occasional, put it that way. And then after 2010, when the market corrected, man, <laughs> I don't know how many of the 70 are from 2010 to today, but probably like 60 of them, maybe 55, because it made sense to buy. And, and, and by the way, that's exactly what I did too. Like I had uh, mutual funds. By 2014, they were gone because I was just buying rental property. I'm like, these numbers are good. I'm going to keep buying. And that's, I think we talked about this ahead of time. So an understanding of investments, which just buy some books. I read the heck out of books when I was in my early 20s because I was really clear. I want to like have an investment scenario where like it, I don't have to work. Like, and so I'm like, let me learn about them. And real estate's just an asset class. Equities are an asset class. You know, bonds are, metals are. Um, nowadays, crypto, but I'm just telling you now, that's a total bubble. It's going to pop. I'm not even going to have the conversation with people that don't understand assets. Um, but real estate's just an asset class. And, and you can... Um, it makes sense to buy sometimes. It makes sense not to buy sometimes. Um, I could foresee if prices keep going like this, being back to not being able to buy rental property that makes sense for us until there's a correction. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't wait for the perfect deal, but I would make sure your numbers make sense for you, for you. I'm going to give some tips that kind of our general tips that we've given in the past or other people have given in the past. And then you say, yes, I agree with that tip or I'd like to tweak it this way. So okay, sure. Yep. one tip is that you should maintain six months of cash reserve reserves for per property to pay, you know, the mortgage in case it, you know, doesn't have. So if you had like repairs. So for example, if, you know, the mortgage it. was a thousand dollars. You should have at least six thousand dollars in the bank saved up. Would you say you should have more than that? We're talking about for the average person. Like I, I know you're, you're no, no, no. You're okay. not so, average. So let me let me circle back on that. That's I I would I would say that's great. So like if 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 someone asked me should I do that and I was like that's super do that that's great you're gonna be fine yes that's great and I mean that I I thought because. I mean, to me, before you ever even buy a, anything, you should have six months of cash in some safe investment that can't go down because we just don't know. Like you want to be able to get along for six months because uh, you'll be able to correct yourself in there. But I mean, so so yes, I, I think that's wonderful. It's conservative. No one's going to get themselves in trouble. It's great. Yes. Okay. Tip number two, buy in a B-class neighborhood where 35%, it's a 35%, 65% ratio of renter to homeowner, meaning there's 35% renters, 65% of that neighborhood are homeowners, 
that is a good ratio. Would you change that ratio? Where are you at on that? Or do you even look at that at all? I don't look at that at all. So I can't really comment on it. The only comment I have is when people say A, B, C, D, I'm like, where's E and F? You know, I mean, like, it's such an arbitrary opinion um, what class it is. But I do think what's important is just the numbers. How much am I paying? What am I going to realistically get for rent? Um, and then is it like we've had really my my view of two bedroom, one bath, duplexes or fourplexes is that you're only going to get seventy five percent of them if you're kind of in a tough area because most of ours are that we have that fit that description are in tough areas. And when I look at it, I'm like, there's always like a unit that is like we're evicting them and it takes four months. I think mean, it's like they never stay full. So um, I would be more concerned about is the characteristic of the property I'm buying going to have a turnover lot? Because turnover doesn't only hurt because you're not getting a payment. Turnover hurts because it's work. You know, when you move a tenant in and they never move, it's perfect. Which Going back to your question, not question, it just um, section eight renters as a category have very low turnover. Okay. So that's a good thing to know. Like if you were to say, how could I rent the place and minimize my chance of having to refill it? In general, a section eight renter does. The problem with section eight rentals is that you do want to have some level of management involved checking the place um, because all you're going to be really worried about is the condition of it. And here's the bigger thing. Um, are they letting other people stay there? Like, are they renting rooms out? You know, and, 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 and granted, that's not a general sweep across section eight, but you don't want eight people living in a place that you should have three people on the lease. Cause you're going to have wear and tear that beats it up far more than three people, if, if that's, you know, your rental thing. But anyhow, I, I think Section 8 is great. I like it. We have, you know, plenty of them. Um, and the reason I like it is the turnover is low. Love yeah. it. Okay. As far as getting prospective tenants, the three things that you should always do is get a credit report on every tenant. So if they're married, make sure that you pull it for the husband and the wife. Also get references from the previous landlords for at least the last two places that they've lived and then verify their income requesting copies of recent pay stubs um, and W-2s to prove income. So anything else on performing background checks on your performance prospective tenants that you would say, this is important, you know, can any other feedback that you found to make sure, because like you talked about in the very beginning, who you get in there is extremely important. Right. So the challenge sometimes is that, so, so go into your first thing on the credit report, you know, I, I have systems in place and people in place, so I'm, I'm not fresh on do we actually get a credit report or do we run this report? I, we use a program called Buildium to manage all of our rental properties, but there's other ones like Appfolio and whatever. Um, I don't know if it pulls an, it, I don't think it pulls an actual credit report, but it pulls enough of an equivalent to understand things. I love pulling the credit report for one reason, back in the day when I used to do this. Um, and that is you can add up their monthly minimums that just to state meet their credit and be like, Ooh, with their monthly minimums and the rent, that doesn't work. So yeah, credit reports, if you can pull it are super because you can see their monthly minimums that they have to make every month in order to, you know, not go into default. Um, the second one, when you can get a landlord reference, that is the set two back, not the current one, but the one before that, that's really good because they can often tell you things 
Whereas the current landlord may want to get them out of the property and be like, oh, they're great <laughs> just to get them out. Um, but yeah, the landlord reference, what's key there is you, you know things like how do they keep the place? And there are a lot of limitations. And I'm again, Katie in my office is up on that to make sure um, there are limitations to what you can and can't say as the prior landlord, but some people may or may not, I, I don't really know. But um, in the third thing you said, you got tenant history, you got credit report. What was the third thing you said? Um, I can't remember what the third one was. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? All right, it was off so, the top but, uh, of my head. At the end of the day, oh, income verification. Absolutely. Yes, well, yes. Okay, it doesn't matter what, get income verification. I want two months of bank statements and paycheck stubs or, or whatever to verify the money's flowing through there. Um, yeah, so that's definitely key. Um, yeah, all three of those I agree with. Um, and, and more often than not, you're going to have a tenant that you can't check every box. Like their credit report might be kind of hosed up, but the landlord, you can only go one back and they've been there three years. And he's like, hey, I'm selling the place. That's how come they're moving. And they paid on time. I mean, I think they were late once and the place is in good condition. It's not like amazing, like if they're painting it for me, but it's in good shape. And, and, and they've had the same job for three years. Check, check, check. They're, they're good. You know, you're just not going to get smelly, rosy, perfect. Um, maybe, maybe you can get that in higher end rentals, but we really don't have higher end rentals because we just have not found a way to make good money with them or make money with them at all, other than appreciation. And I'm very much not a guy who wants to, when I buy the investment, I don't want it to keep feeding it. The other tip is not to forget that, you know, rental property is really good at tax time because when you own an investment property, your schedule E tax form has you able to like really write up, write off so much stuff, like all the painting to changing light bulbs. And so there's a lot of things that you can write off. Mm -hmm. And so right now, if someone's thinking, okay, look, I did, I used the the calculator that you gave me, Chantel, I put everything in there and let's say I'm estimating all the repairs and I'm making just a little bit of money or, you know, I'm breaking even, is it worth it to be able to also get all those benefits at tax time plus get that appreciation coming in? What's your well, thoughts on that? And, 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 all right, you, uh, two things. I'm surprised we didn't talk about it earlier, but it's occurring to me. It might have expired. Anyhow, one of the th expenses you didn't mention is called depreciation, which is kind of like a fake expense, meaning like if let's just use around numbers. You bought a place for 100000 Generally, 75% of it you can depreciate. I think that's over like 28 years. So let's just pretend that was 25 years instead, and it's exactly $3,000 a year. So if you had exactly $3,000 of profit from that rental property, you pay zero federal tax because your depreciation is 3000 So that's a expense that you didn't even put money out for and you, you know, you get to keep without federal taxes. Um, the big deal, which may have expired now, but may still be valid is called accelerated depreciation. Um, that is insane. I mean, where you're, you're deducting like 75% furniture fixture. I forget all the things. But that, that's where people were buying rental property left and right, because you like buy a $300,000 house and you're deducting in your first year, 75% of all the depreciation you're going to get. So like you're getting $150,000 write off. So you bought like 10 of them, you got one and a half million to write off. It was insane. And it still is insane. So when you start talking about taxes, um, it can make sense with accelerated depreciation to buy things that you might not have bought particularly if you have a high income and you're trying to not pay taxes on that. But that gets a little bit complicated on the math. For the simple math, 
yeah, you're going to depreciate it over like, let's just say 25 years, even though it's more. And in the meantime, you know, that depreciation counts again at anything you make. So it's kind of cool. Mm. Did so I confuse other- you or are you with me? No, I'm with you. I'm totally with you. Um, So tell me, what are the other tips that you would give someone when they're kind of making this decision? Because I I feel like right now, more than ever, people are in this conundrum where they're like, well, the numbers don't exactly work, but I've been sitting on the sidelines for so long. I haven't gotten in the game. I haven't gotten in the game. I haven't gotten in the game. And meanwhile, I wish I would have gotten the game last year. I wish I would have gotten the game five years ago. Wish I would have gotten it. So it's kind of like where they are, what numbers make sense or any advice you have for those people? It's difficult. I would say for sure, buy based on an accurate assessment of what you're going to get for rent and what your costs are going to be. Because, because the main thing to really, really like understand is, Hey man, life is full of unexpected. And if I'm really struggling just to maintain this, when something unexpected happens in life, it's going to be really difficult. Uh, real estate is unlike equities or bonds or any other asset class in that when you own it, it's a continual like can be a drain. It can reach up and like, you know, strangle you. Um, so that's the main thing is the numbers, because if you're like, hey, I'm, I'm good. Like you said, six months for reserve. That's like awesome. Just if you had that for every property, it'd be awesome. Um, you're going to be fine. Um I'm really against buying negative cash flow, especially like if you said, hey, it's a $1,200 PITI and I'm getting $1,400 in rent, I'd be like, that's fine. You know, you don't have to, you don't have this whole, you know, you're going to have some negatives, but it's not like you're buying uh, a $1,200 rent, a rental at $1,200 paying $1,400 PITI and then adding those other costs. Um, so hold on. So let me stop you because what, what I'm hearing you say is, let's say someone gets my calculator, my Excel spreadsheet, and basically they factor in all those items, okay? They factor in the repairs, the accounting and legal, the vacancy, the management fees, the HOA. I've got them all listed on there. If they fill that out and it breaks even, okay? That's good. Or they're not really you, that's making a very money. conservative sheet you have. Now, yes. I would say buy that unless yeah. you just don't want to buy it. And yeah, if you have that, six months. And if yeah. you have six months, so it doesn't yeah. strangle no you. One, no one's going to get in trouble with that spreadsheet. Okay. Because, I mean, it's very conservative, which will keep them out of trouble. It may be difficult to find a property that matches that. But um, yeah, it's a night. It's very conservative as far as keeping people safe and not getting themselves financially, you know, strung out. Yeah, so I, I'd say that's a nice, safe spreadsheet. Um, and then if you can't make the deal work and you think it makes sense, just how far do you deviate from that is an individual choice on risk. Which I mean, I think is one of the topics we're not really touching on, and that is we've had all this appreciation, which has been, you know, nice in a lot of regards. Um, Interest rates six months ago, two and a half percent or sub three. Um, Yesterday I met with a guy who owns a mortgage company and he said they're at 5.25. So um, now what's going to keep us from tanking. And I say, keep us from tanking. Believe me, we can tank. I don't, have a crystal ball, but what's different from the 2008 thing is we're not giving loans to people who can't really repay them. And that's exactly what we were doing before. Um, And the other thing is our inventory is so low. So because the inventory is so low and also all these baby boomers that thought it was cool to rent an apartment are realizing like, that's a really dumb idea. I should have bought a house. And now they're, that that's a huge buying segment in the 30 to 40. And um, 
they're all moving into the market wanting a house. So I think, no, I pray real estate's not going to go boom. boom. <laughs> okay. But um, because interest rates go up, people never buy a price. Like we haven't, we've been talking like, what's the monthly? That's what people buy monthly. When interest rates go from 3% to 6%, what you can buy goes down in value a tremendous amount. Because if you can afford 2000 a month, that might have bought you 400000 and now it buys you 275 So there's definitely going to be down pressure, but uh, there's a lot of up pressure because the inventory is so low. So I think it'll be okay, but we're definitely moving into one of those things that you're like, am I buying at the peak? And the answer is, um, I don't know. But I do know over time, it always corrects. So as long as you can hang in for you know 15 years, you're going to be fine. <laughs> you just don't want to be hanging in for 15 years, paying 5,000 a month negative cash flow. Great. Now, uh, how does someone decide whether they should go ahead and hire a property management company or if they should do it themselves? So what would your advice be if someone right, said- So one quick started. tip on that, which is really like worth a million bucks. If you do it yourself, um, put the rental property in an entity called like real estate partners. Just have the word partners in it. Even if it's an LLC, it doesn't matter. And never, ever, ever let the prospective tenants know you have any ownership, any, zero. Because you want to play the good cop, bad cop scenario where you're just the guy getting paid to be the property manager and you agree with them but the partnership has said otherwise. So, so like never, ever, ever let a tenant know you're the owner because they're just going to suck up to you and bother the crap out of you. Like literally bother the crap out of you. They're going to be really nice to that. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's just such a mess. Just trust me. Never, ever, ever do that. All right. Um, the other thing is if you just buy a quick book on property management, I mean, like, Amazon, whatever. It's really simple. Stick to a structure and never deviate. Like on the sixth, 10% rent rent rate, the, the rents are late on the fifth, on the sixth, you pay 10%. Never let them not pay that ever because that teaches them rent's not due by the fifth. Rent's due when I pay it. <laughs> like you never deviate. And then you send it off for collections on the 12th. I mean, the attorney, like just set a system never deviate. Um, if you deviate, you're going to be my future customer selling me, you know, your rental property in pain. Um, now, should you self-manage or should you get a property manager? That's really dependent on you. I mean, you want to self-manage, self-manage. Just listen to what I said earlier. And the second thing is, is how many? Like, if you're going to self-manage five, that's fine. If you're going to self-manage 10 and you have a full-time job, eh. <laughs> um, so it just depends numbers. The unfortunate thing about property management in the single family residential arena is that the very best property manager you can get, like the best is mediocre at best. Like there's only really crappy and mediocre at best. And it's just because the asset class, it just, I'm going to go into like economies of scale and all that. But so the problem with property managers is, you know, the best one you're going to get is mediocre. I agree with you. <laughs> um, and we, we did property management for about a year and I vowed we would never as <laughs> do that property management ever, ever again. You could not pay me to do it. And all of my property properties are managed by a property management company. Yep. And I honestly suggest hiring a property management company that is a franchise because franchises systems. Can, their systems are just, even though the people might be a, not so, amazing. So I, have a, I have a funny note on that though. Okay. I, and I agree with you categorically, just end of story. Right. They have systems way better than a non-franchise. 
But the difference between renter's warehouse and real property management, if I was a landlord, would be getting nickel and dime to death with RPM. Uh, they have got like a ridiculous number of profit centers. <laughs> Just like, what? <wow. laughs> so, yeah, but RPM is a, gr- a good company, but you probably, if you compared them side by side, like I have a friend that owns one and he looked at the what renter's warehouse model and he's like, there's no money. If we did that, we wouldn't be making money at RPM. So yeah, you you want to take a fine look at all the costs because they can nickel and dime you. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, this has been awesome. Tell listeners how they can find you, where they can follow you at, and learn more about you. Um, so that's a good question because I don't really do much at this point with any of the stuff you just said. Our, our main brand that we're buying houses with right now is iBuy757.com. Um, our main website, We Buy Houses Locally, is cool, but we're doing more electric media now, like TV or whatever. So I need something short and sweet, but that that's our company. I mean, we buy property and we buy it at the numbers we need it at. Um, I'm not in the coaching business or anything at this point. Don't plan on it. Um, But you, you basically, if someone's a real estate agent and they go, they sit down with somebody and they go, I've got to sell right now. I need a cash offer. You're the guy they need to go to. Number one, or number two, Yeah. number two, if someone's listening to this and they say, look, I should have listened to this podcast a long time ago. I'm burnt out. I am, you know, didn't do any of the things you you said on this podcast. I just want to wipe my hands clean of this rental property. Again, you would be that person to go to. Yeah. You know what? Call or just, uh, I buy 757.com. You're going to, you're going to end up, if you call us or fill out that form, you're going to end up with us. And, um, that's easy to remember. I buy 757, this area code. Uh, we just had an agent yesterday do exactly what you said that. She's like, oh my God, look at this. We need to get rid of it now. We're like, cool, done. I love yeah. it. Well, so, if you guys want this podcast and you want to get the spreadsheet that I was talking about that has all the numbers, it's super easy. Please comment below in the the text or you can email and we will get that over to you right away. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Chantel. Thanks, Matt. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com.